Hello, this is another general psychology mini lecture with Ian McFarlane, and today's topic is neuroimaging. So all this week we've been dealing with the brain. We started out talking about the brain at a cellular level, going over the structure of neurons and how action potentials work. We moved on to talking about structures inside the brain, what they're responsible for. When we went over the different structures of the brain, I gave you a number of pictures that showed where the structures were located, but I didn't really talk about how we had those pictures. Uh, so the purpose of today's mini lecture is to talk about how we look at the brain. Uh, now before we talk about the current ways we look at the brain, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the history of it. So how have we studied the nervous system over the course of time? Uh, some of our earliest investigations involve looking at autopsy tissue. Uh, so one of the first people to really look at human physiology from a scientific perspective was Hippocrates. And he actually would make a habit of digging up the recently deceased uh, from the cemetery and start cutting them open and figuring out what went wrong. Um, and we still do that. When someone has a brain injury, uh, we oftentimes, with the permission of the relatives, will go in and look at the autopsy tissue uh, to see what was going on in that person's brain. This is the only way we can conclusively diagnose some things today, like Alzheimer's. Uh, we also look at autopsy tissue in a number of animal samples. We can make a reasonable hypothesis that the part that was damaged is responsible for language. Uh, same thing with certain personality aspects, uh, certain emotional regulation systems, vision, you name it, movement. So we can test the behavior of patients with brain damage to see uh, what the deficit is. Now in, in animal research, we can actually go in and purposefully destroy or damage parts of the brain in order to confirm some of these pieces of information, these hypotheses we get from looking at humans with brain damage. Now in addition to a structural level, we also sometimes are interested in what the brain is doing. So for example, sometimes we use what's called an electroencephalogram. You probably know of it as an EEG. An EEG is when a number of sensors are placed on the skull. These sensors detect electrical signals. So they're able to monitor the ele overall electrical activity of the brain. And you get brain waves uh, like you've probably seen before. Um, we'll also talk about the EEG and brain waves when we talk about sleep this later this semester. Um, the EEG is nice. It can show pretty uh, easily when someone's having seizures, for example. Um, but it is fairly limited in, in that it can only really show us overall brain activity. Uh, and so we, we oftentimes want a finer grain image than that or to see what particular parts of the brain are doing. That's where we need things like neuroimaging. So the rest of this mini lecture is going to cover different types of neuroimaging available to uh, psychologists and others studying how the brain works. Okay, primarily what we're looking at when we talk about neuroimaging is uh, pictures of the brain. We want to be able to see the brain in action as much as possible. So the, one of the first ways we were able to do this is through the use of what's called contrast x-rays. Now contrast x-rays are a method to look at the structure of different components of the brain. The way this works is you either are injected with or you drink uh, radioactive dye that gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And then as that blood circulates throughout your body and up into your brain, you can take pictures of it with x-rays. The same type of x-rays you would use to check and see if a bone was broken. Now what happens is these x-rays are absorbed differently by the dye than by surrounding material. So what this really lets you do is see blood vessels in the brain. This can be really useful for detecting things like blood clots in the brain, things like hematomas, which are uh, bleeds in the brain, um, or even things like strokes sometimes. Uh, and a contrast x-ray picture usually looks something like this. So you can see here the, the brighter white spots are the blood vessels that snake throughout the brain. Okay, and they stand out really clearly 
and if there was a clot or a buildup somewhere, you could use this picture to, to take a look and see uh, where that was located. The next major innovation in neuroimaging was the X-ray computed topography uh, scan. Now, uh, this is usually referred to as either the CT scan or a CAT scan. Uh, it's the same thing. This came around in the early 1970s. Uh, and really the nice part of this is you're able to see the actual structure of the brain. Uh, the way CT scans work is they take a whole bunch of different x-rays and then the computer will uh, compile all that information into one picture. With one picture that represents information from many scans, you're able to get much sharper image quality. Uh, so with a CT scan, uh, once it compiles information, it might look something like this. This is a horizontal slice of the brain, so you're looking down on top of the person's head from here. Uh, you can see you've got ventricles here. These are the really dark spaces. Those are actually, there's actually no brain material there. This really white on the outside is the skull. And then in here you have all the brain matter. Now this is nice for us to see what's going on in the brain. We can locate things like tumors this way if there's something growing there that shouldn't be. If you look at the picture, the image quality isn't great. It's hard to distinguish specific features. Um, we don't really get the resolution that we would need to make fine grain uh, decisions. Uh, the other limitation of CT scans is it only takes a picture at the one level of horizontal slice. Okay, for example, this is probably something like a millimeter thick. Okay, so if what you were looking for, the tumor or whatever, started three millimeters above where you took the slice or two millimeters below where you took the slice, you wouldn't be able to see it at all. Okay, so while this is, is nice and good, it's, its use is somewhat limited in terms of you want to you have to be able to know pretty specifically where what you're looking for will be located. The next big innovation in neuroimaging was magnetic resonance imaging, or MRIs. MRIs are specifically to look at the structure of whatever you're looking at. Now, for us, we're going to talk about the brain, but this is used a lot in things like knees and um, other parts of the body to look for structural damage um, to ligaments and things like that. So the way an MRI works is instead of using the radioactive dyes or x-rays, uh, you're placed inside a strong magnetic field and then radio waves are shot through the field. As the radio waves pass through space, they are affected by the medium through which they pass. So a computer is able to read uh, and interpret the, the different radio waves as they cross the magnetic field and produce a wonderful picture. Now, it can be somewhat uncomfortable for patients uh, if you've ever had an MRI, you have to kind of crawl into this giant metal tube and then they tell you to hold perfectly still and then it sounds like there's an earthquake going on and the whole world is collapsing around you. Uh, it takes a lot of machinery and it's, it's loud to generate these magnetic fields, um, but you have to do your best to hold really still because if you move around you can uh, wreck the image. Now, the, the images that it produces are much higher resolution than the CT scans we just talked about. Uh, you can see in a sample uh, MRI here, now this is a very similar uh, slice, horizontal slice of the brain, so again we're looking straight down. Now this is at a different level, so we don't have the ventricles in the exact same place, but as you go through you can see there's much more clearly things are defined here. Uh, you can see some other little smaller ventricles uh, and you can see you know the structure of the brain with much greater clarity than you are able to in the CT scan. The other real advantage of MRIs is MRIs are able to do more than just 2D pictures. You can actually have 3D pictures um, from MRIs, and that's often quite useful 
as you're able to look at a broader area of the brain and you're able to get a better sense of how things are working. Uh, for example, here would be an MRI of more or less the full brain. Okay, this looks a lot more like what we're used to seeing when we look at the brain because typically when we see it, it's in a 3D uh, capacity. All right, so all these different uh, imaging techniques are out there, but if you've noticed, we've been focusing solely on structure here. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, we're oftentimes interested as well in what the brain is doing. We want to be able to see the activity of the brain. One way to do this is with positron emission topography, or PET, or PET scans. So the purpose here is not to look at structure per se, but to be able to see the activity levels of different parts of the brain. So the way this works is uh, you're injected with uh, glucose, which is the way, what the brain uses for energy. Uh, but this glucose contains a radioactive dye. Okay, and as this radioactive dye works its way up into the brain, uh, you can ask people to do certain tasks. This might be uh, a math test, or reading a story, or thinking about a particular situation, or even just you know moving their hand, something like that. And what it will do is it will show you uh, which part of the brain is more active uh, compared to the rest. So the colors here on the, the Roy G. Biv spectrum, the reds are the highest level of activity followed by orange and yellow, and then green follows with blue, indigo, and violet being the uh, least active portions of the brain. Now if you look, you can see that the outside is purple or violet. That is the skull. There is no activity, there's no sugar uh, glucose being used by your skull. You can also see, you know, in this places where you, there are ventricles, you see very little activity. Um, However, if we look down here, you see an area of high activity. There are pieces of high activity in other areas as well. So we're able to do this uh, to figure out where certain capacities are located. For example, if you're doing a math problem, and this is what lights up in your brain, we know that certain areas, like this down here, would be related to your mathematical processing, while something over here is probably not. Okay, or at least connected to a much uh, lower degree. Now this is really neat. We've been able to do a lot of cool research with this. Um, but again, just like the CT scans, we're limited here to a 2D picture. Okay, so all the same limitations apply. We also at, have the limitation here of if we're interested in both activity and structure, we would have to run two different scans. A PET scan for activity and then something like an MRI or a CT scan to look at the structure. To deal with this problem, uh, we developed what's called functional MRIs or functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, the advantage of this is you can see both the structure and the activity. It takes the structural uh, resolution of the MRI and it also contains uh, information about the activity. Now remember that MRIs are done in a magnetic field, uh, so this does not require the use of radiation, which is another advantage that we don't have to expose patients to uh, levels of radiation unnecessarily. And just as the MRI gave you much more resolution than the CAT scan, the uh, fMRI will give you much better resolution than the PET scan. Okay, so remember what the PET scan looked like. And then if we look here, okay, the fMRI, we get the structural uh, resolution, but we also get a much more targeted display of the areas that are of high and low use. So the way the fMRI works is they, they take a picture of your brain while you're not doing anything, and they take another picture while you're engaged in whatever task they're trying to measure. Then they subtract the brain activity associated with rest from the brain activity associated with the task, and what you're left with is places that are working more than they were in the neutral position and places that were working less than they were in the neutral position.
okay, which is much easier for us to interpret than when you have kind of every color on the rainbow working all over the place. Just as the MRI is capable of taking 3D pictures, the fMRI is also capable of taking 3D pictures, uh, and it would look something like this. Okay, again, you get a chance to see in much greater detail and across a much broader scale okay, where exactly is the activity coming from. Now, as we learn more and more about what's going on at the neuronal level uh, in the brain, uh, we are getting more and more interested in kind of what neurons are attached to what. The idea of these um, neural networks um, has become very intriguing. And we developed a way to start measuring this as well. And that's called magnetoencephalography. So this is very similar to an EEG, but whereas the EEG uses sensors on the skull to measure overall brain electrical activity, what the MEG does is it actually measures changes in magnetic fields uh, that are influenced by the electrical charges in the brain. So essentially it measures the minute changes in magnetic fields caused by action potentials firing. Uh, now, whereas with the EEG, you get the little sensors on your skull, if you do an MEG, uh, it, the apparatus is a little more intimidating. Um, but it has to be this big to be able to measure the minute changes uh, in magnetic field that are produced. Now, the really great thing about this is we can start to trace uh, where electrical impulse starts and where it, it goes to next. Uh, so we've been able to start mapping neural networks. When we start talking about memory and how memory works next week, um, I'm going to come back to this concept of neural networks uh, in terms of how memories are stored. Now what we can start to do is generate outputs like this. Now it's a little hard to see with the colors, but the, uh, there are little red lines in here, and these represent uh, connections in your neural network. So as one neuron fires, it traces the action potential down the axon to the next neuron, and then it traces it from there down the axon to the next, and so on and so forth, until you can come up with these really complex maps of how the brain is working. So to wrap up, we have talked about several different sources of uh, neuroimaging, uh, including some of the early advances in how we've looked at the brain. Um, we've looked at the evolution from contrast x-rays all the way up to MEG and everything in between. If you have any questions about this material, uh, feel free to send me an email or come by office hours, and I will be happy to work with you to clear up any confusion. That's all for this time, and I'll see you in class.